in and you're asking like, what do we do about is you sign a contract with someone? So real quick, before you did that, did you more than 30 years i got my real estate license in the um, and your your origin story is that he uh, he made an age joke the last time we were uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna use that kuka you know I, i'm a little more strict with what i'm i'm looking at uh Show of hands, how many people here would consider themselves a real estate investor already? Okay, that's a, that's a really, really good amount. And how many people are investing in mortgage notes already? I guess I'm going to teach you why. I'm going to teach you why. And we solve a large problem of that, which happens to be inventory. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit later about the group we have uh, where we provide inventory. But I am general partner of Elios Capital Group, which is a $50 million note fund. And I want to share more of my background and how I got started into real estate too. Because like many of us, I stumbled into it. My parents did not invest in real estate at all. And so I'm originally from South Carolina. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina now. And at a time when I feel like in the black community, a lot of our parents and grandparents were moving up north for jobs, my grandfather decided to stay. And so he was a sharecropper in South Carolina. My dad was one of 12, didn't finish high school, had to work to help my grandmother provide for the family. My mom was a bank teller for a large part of her life. And so I went to school and when I went to college, she went back and got her degree to become a teacher. But we did not grow up in a family where we were talking about real estate investing, really investing at all. It was definitely get an education, get a job, you know, go into corporate, and that's how we were gonna build wealth. And so I actually majored in uh, broadcast, German minor, wanted to be a reporter until I found out how much reporters made <laughs> coming out of college. It was under 20,000 at that time. It was a rough life. Uh, and so I kind of stumbled into business. So German minor, I always wanted to go study abroad, but we couldn't really afford to pay for study abroad. And like many of us, I was blessed to have a professor who really believed in me and he literally printed out a piece of paper for a U.S. State Department program and put it on my desk and said, apply. Amen. Amen is right. <laughs> and I actually didn't believe I would get into it. It was like an all expenses paid trip to Germany for a year. A visa, we were youth ambassadors. They only picked 75 Americans from all over the country to go. And so I did the first application half-heartedly. Like, oh, okay. They're not from South Carolina. They're not going to pick me. Got to the second round. Know, got a little bit more excited. Got to the third round, and they interviewed 150 people, and 75 got to go. And I was blessed to be one of those 75 that got to go. Uh, got to go. Thank you. And I didn't realize I had actually never left South Carolina. I went to college in my hometown. So this is the first time I ever even left home. And I get there and end up doing an internship at BMW, working on an SAP project which if you're not familiar with SAP, it's a very large scale tech system. I knew zero about tech, got the job because I was fluent English and German, and they wanted me to do the communications in both languages. That was why I got the job. But I stumbled into tech and realized what an opportunity it was. I ended up coming back to the US, starting a career in B2B sales at AT&T, telecom career for anybody out there who has worked in telecom, and then, they transferred me out to California. This is in the height of 2007, 2008, which you just spoke about. There's not a lot of jobs, especially not entry level when you're just getting uh, started. And so they transferred me out to California, and I would end up meeting my boss at a Starbucks there, who uh, told me I could get my first big girl job or I could get on a plane and fly to work. It's like, you can live anywhere you want as long as you're willing to get on a plane. And so that was my first foray into tech. And I'm telling you all this for a reason, so I really get to the real estate part, but I think this is really important. And so once I got into that tech job, again, didn't have any coaching from my family, I ended up getting a job where they made a lot of commitments around pay, but none of it was in writing. And so within nine months, I found myself in a position where I was making less money than I was making at AT&T. 
and I ended up quitting the company to go to another job, but I had signed a really nasty non-compete. And uh, within six weeks of being at my new job, this company chased me down at 23 years old uh, on a non-compete, and I was back out of work after six weeks working at Olive Garden, waiting tables again. This is also where my husband, we are uh, just dating at this point, but I just told him he could go to culinary school, and so we're making culinary school payments out of pocket. Both of us are back in the restaurant uh, at Olive Garden part-time and just trying to figure out how to make, make things work. And so the one mentor I met while I was at that tech company ended up going to another tech company and said, hey, I think you can get a job here in California. They don't care about a non-compete. Come over here. Apply for the job, and you know how you can feel it in your bones when something's for you. I, I was like, this is it. I went in, killed the interview, I did a 30, 60, 90 day plan. They told me this is the best interview you've ever, I've ever had anybody do. And wouldn't you know that at the end, they declined taking me uh, on the job because they wanted someone that lived in California or Palo Alto. And I had just moved back to Charlotte because my older sister was sick at the time. I needed to be close to family. And so they turned me down purely because they wanted someone to be local in California. But what do you know that three weeks later, the phone rang and they called me back and they said, we interviewed all these other candidates in California, but none of them were as good as you. And so we're going to make an exception and you're going to be the very first person that we hire uh, for working the line to work at the company. And that was the other big thing that changed my life. I had spent in the next nine years of my career working in tech, Silicon Valley Tech, and got to do it from Charlotte, so I can still stay close to family. And so I'm working the corporate ladder, moving up the chain, pushing through, pushing through, lots of obstacles I'm gonna drag you through, but as a black woman in tech, I'm sure you can imagine what they were like. But then I got to a point where I realized people were making the most money on the other side of the table, investing. And in tech, you see a lot around venture capital. Are, are you, anyone here familiar with venture capital? So if you're not familiar with venture capital, effectively it's when people uh, are investing, say over investing in real estate, but they're investing in companies. Now it is definitely high risk, high reward, but people are making 30%, 50% or higher investments. So you see all these billionaires out there who talk about being an early investor in Google, right? Early investor in Uber is through venture capital with how they invest. And so while I'm working in corporate, climbing the ladders, you know, six figures, Golden handcuffs, a lot of us have worked in corporate, you know what it's like. I'm watching everybody on the other side of the table make money on the investing side. And I said, how do I get into venture capital? Which is a space that is less than, no joke representation wise, less than 2% women and minorities come up. And so I managed to break into venture capital uh, and start to sit on the investing side of the table. Learn how the odds were stacked against us on that side of the table too. Not only were black people and women not getting money to put in their companies, they also weren't getting the opportunity to put their money in deals. And so I'm not gonna talk about venture capital too much today, but I did join and help start a group called Cap Table Coalition, which are all black and Latinx investors, where we take up space on cap tables. And so I started writing checks, investing in companies. So here's the other thing I want to tell you guys at the same time. Venture capital is again high risk, high reward. You're investing in your, what you believe that people can do. And I'm like, that's cool and all. I like it. We're getting access to good deals. But what about real estate? What about real estate investing? I actually think I like that better because it's backed by a physical asset. And so my husband and I, at this point, the guy I was dating in culinary school, he's my husband. We stumbled into real estate in our first home where we took our wedding money. And instead of spending on the wedding, we put it up down came on the house. It was by accident, but we did that. We looked to Vegas, bought our first house, and within three years, they had appreciated over 30 percent. We then refinanced that house, took the money out, invested in our first investment property. And so, like many of us, it's kind of the same as my journey in tech and real estate. You learn about the levels of the food chain, and you go up the food chain. So we started with fixing and flipping properties, like many of us. That was all good and fine. Until you have some really, and I know somebody's got to talk about fix and flip, so I'm not knocking fix and flip until you have a really bad experience with fix and flip properties. It is properties. It is work to fix and flip properties. We did one in Atlanta in particular, where literally Atlanta is a whole other ball game for the market. It was definitely an area you would call it good, but literally the first night we had our lumber package dropped off. Somebody pulled in, back again overnight with a truck ready to steal their lumber package the first night. I'm not making this up. 
there goes another $10,000 of paper security. Right off the jump, right? We had issues with grading that the contractor didn't figure out. Five to $5,000 grading. Fix and flip, any, any real estate, you've got to do diligence, but you can watch your margins be eaten through very, very quickly with slip ups like that, unanticipated expenses, the cost of materials are going up, the people that are doing framing are taking three weeks instead of one week. Now a whole new cost of more because I gotta pay interest rate on my money. It's it's a grind. You can make money on it, but you gotta really be prepared for the grind. And so I ended up getting to a place where I'm talking to my husband's aunt, and we're walking through our real estate plan. We're fixing and flipping here, we're gonna take that cash, we just bought property, we're gonna do short-term rentals. I bought my granddad's land, the sharecropper was passed away in 99 last year, but I bought his house and his land. Had 10 acres behind it under contract doing new construction. And she's like, yeah, yeah, that's great. You guys are doing awesome. But let me tell you why I sold all 110 doors I had and uh, sold all those just to invest in mortgage notes. And I was like, okay, tell me more. And so what was supposed to be a 30 minute conversation, it ended up being a 90 minute conversation. And she broke down to me the power of investing in mortgage notes and why it's such an important thing to have in your portfolio. And so beyond those issues I talked about a little bit with fixing and flipping, new construction, you experience a lot of those similar challenges with your profit margins. And with her, she kind of shared, she's from New York, um, from Brooklyn, and she was sharing how she had someone murdered on her doorstep before. All these different things that happen as a landlord, right, that you have to deal with when you have doors. And she's like, all those things go away because I'm in the uh, game of paperwork, but it's backed by physical asset. I still get that same protection of physical asset. And there was a note workshop that next weekend. I made it work, flew out to Houston, went to my first note workshop, and that's where I met my two partners now at Ethios Capital Group. We've got a $50 million fund invested in more jobs. So that is my journey. I say that to say anybody in here can do that too. If you have no experience in it, it's definitely something that you can get into. With the time I have left, I'm going to walk you through the opportunity mortgage notes, and then for anybody that wants to dive in deeper between two and three, I'll be in it. Next slide, please. So what is mortgage note investing? We're actually already, everybody in here is probably in the, in the note game in some degree. So our cell phones, if you got a cell phone, you didn't pay for it out of pocket, you had to put a note on it to buy the phone, right? The mortgage note is all that paperwork that you have to sign when you buy a house or a property, right? So in the mortgage note game, what you're buying is not keys, you're buying the paperwork. And so if you're a person that likes going in with a sledgehammer, knocking walls down, all of those things, you want to get keys in your hand, that's not, mortgage note investing is not for you. But if you're someone who likes to make money and get paid first and have a more passive investment, it can be a fantastic opportunity. And so when we think about mortgage notes, you can invest in all types of notes, first lien, second lien notes. We primarily focus on first lien mortgages, residential, commercial, land, the whole gamut, because pretty much you're becoming the bank, right? So instead of us buying property, you're right, using hard money or whatever the case may be, you're actually becoming the bank and taking the payments. Next slide. So why invest in mortgage notes? One, you get to invest in paperwork backed by physical asset. And why that is important is because if you're like me, and at some point you get tired of a lot of the variables that you have to do with real estate, you can step away with that in mortgage notes. So uh, for anybody here that's got doors, even if you've got a great property manager, you're still responsible for that property, right? Something goes wrong, you gotta fix it, right? Your tenants are buying the property from you. And mortgage note investing is actually the opposite, right? They're buying the property from us, the bank, and so it's not our job to fix the property. Things go wrong, the tenant has to fix them, we just collect the payment and the interest every month. But, again, it's backed by physical assets, so if things go wrong, if there's a default, you still get the benefit of having real estate behind it that you can actually take possession of to secure your asset. Unlike venture capital, right? When companies just plummet, your money's gone, you get that benefit here. Next is that it has great returns in cash flow. So, unlike some buy and hold strategies, and again, I'm not knocking any of those, I'm just telling you why this could be an important part of your portfolio, your cash flow is not dependent on rental rates in the area or your occupancy. Right? I know a lot of people that get into a property, you want to have it for a buy and hold, you're anticipating a certain amount to cover the mortgage within cash flow, and depending on what's going on in your city in that market at that time, you may not actually have a cash flow in asset. Right? You may actually have an asset where your value is going to be seen on the back end. 
when you invest in performing notes, they are going to cash flow within usually 60 to 90 days of you purchasing it. So a performing note just means that the buyers are paying their mortgages on time. And so within a very short time frame, you're already getting your principal back plus your interest right off the gate. They also have great returns on performing notes. We're seeing 11% plus um, on your return strategy, cash over cash year over year. The other one is that it really is can be passive income for, for you, an opportunity to reclaim your time. And a huge part of that is to think about scaling up a large portfolio of doors, scaling up a fix and flip strategy. It is very, 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 very time consuming. And if you're not spending time there, unless you have a great team, you're losing money. <laughs> because I'm telling you right now, working with contractors, budgets, you will lose your profit margin on the smallest, smallest thing, right? Mortgage notes really give you a chance to scale a portfolio very quickly with little time invested, especially if it's performing notes. Because once you actually go through the front end, it's a front end process, I'll talk about it a little bit later. Once you go through that front end due diligence process and buy the note, for the most part, you're just collecting the payment. And we actually recommend put a service in provider in front of there that helps collect those payments for you. So you don't even have to interact with the buyer. But it's a much easier way to scale a portfolio quickly and build truly passive income. And then there's multiple exit strategies on notes. So once you're in the community, right, if it's a non-performing note, you can actually exit that property in a lot of ways where you can um, resell the note. You can usually go through an eviction or foreclosure process, take possession of the asset. You can sell it as is, which is what we usually do to a wholesale or investor. But we have a few people that actually will do the work to bring it up to market value. So they'll go in, flip that property, bring it up to market value, put it on the market and sell it. But there's a whole variety of ways that you can exit, which makes us a very strong investment. Next slide. So let me talk a little bit about the risk, because obviously any investment that you go into has some risk. Uh, the biggest risk is going to be due diligence risk, which is being sloppy on the front end and not going into the paperwork diligently. Um, so if you're going into a mortgage note and you didn't do your homework and you thought you were first lien, but there's a bunch of tax liens on the property or HOE liens, right? Those types of things can get you in trouble. Um, if you're not thorough on going through the ownership and getting the original documents, you can get in trouble mostly on the front end with mortgage notes. That's also part of the legal risk, right? Is not being thorough on the paperwork. And so a lot of what we focus on is helping people understand how to do that due diligence. Default risk. Depends on how you consider this, but if you're buying a performing note and you just want to take payments, someone defaults on the property, you're going to have to go through the process to actually evict or foreclose on the property. Generally, we don't mind that because your returns are much higher when you take possession of the asset. The difference between 11% performing to 30-40% or greater on non-performing. So we actually enjoy the non-performing notes. So we, our fund is called the Make Money and Go to Heaven Fund, and it's a little cheeky. But it's because we are also very relationship-based, so we really do work with our buyers to keep them at the home. We try to figure out different things we can do before foreclosing, et cetera. But when you have to, you have to, you can't keep people in homes they can't afford, right? And so at some point you may have to take possession of the asset. Prepayment risk with any mortgage people prepay, you don't get the interest, right? That you anticipate over the life of the loan. Servicing risk, we always recommend working with a servicer similar to a property manager to take your payments. There are laws around the way you communicate with buyers, so you don't want to put yourself in a position to do something illegal with communicating with the buyer. Uh, and then regulatory risk. So COVID was a huge exception, nothing we've ever seen, but obviously you could not foreclose, right, for those two years within COVID. And so a lot of people who were the note game were just back in. It doesn't mean you don't get there eventually, but it just took a little bit longer to be able to go through those processes. So I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip through this slide. Yeah, I'll be at the tables and, and dive in a little bit more, but what is the no buying process like? So what are you actually doing if you buy a no? So the first step is you actually have to, actually have to identify inventory, right? We do help you find ways to identify inventory, but if you're in part of our note community, then uh, we actually give you inventory monthly because we're buying notes at scale through the fund. And so we also have a retail community. If you just want one or two in your portfolio, you want to be more hands-on in managing your notes, then you can do that. And so we provide inventory monthly. But then the next step is initial due diligence, which we call desktop due diligence. So many of you are doing this already if you're in the real estate game, right? You're getting on Zillow. We're looking up the value of the home. We're on Google Maps, we're seeing what's going on in the area, how close are we to a Walmart. We're really understanding what the value is of that property and our ability to get back out of that asset, right, if we need to at some point. We're also starting to do our research on liens. Are there any tax liens? How much are they behind on taxes? We're starting to put together an initial budget. 
If, if that point we like, kind of in that soft due diligence, we like what we're looking at, we think we want to make an offer, we go into deep dive due diligence, right? And at this point, we're pulling the title report. I heard somebody else talk about title earlier. We're pulling that title report. We're going to go to that. We're actually going to call a realtor in that area, no matter where it is in the country, we're going to get them drive by the house and take pictures. Because you don't want to buy a note if you think there's a house on it and it burned down two years ago, and you're actually buying a piece of land with no house, right? You've got to be thorough on the due diligence. This is really a due diligence game. If that looks good, we actually go to offer and purchase. One thing I'm going to show, at least one example, so I'm going to skip around a little bit so I can show you an example of a note deal. But on that offer and purchase, depending on the note, whether it's full performing, kind of semi-performing or non-performing, you can actually get huge discounts on buying into these notes. And you're buying them on the unpaid balance of the note, not the as-is value of the property, which is huge. I'll show you that in the example. But you're in a position where you want to make an offer, you go to deal desk, and then once you go to that offer, then we go through the close, you're working with your attorney, we're getting everything recorded, you're getting those original documents, which we recommend putting in a fireproof safe. You've got to have the originals, right? It's a document game. And then you're getting your servicer set up and you're off to the races with your note. And so that's why I say this really is a front-end due diligence paperwork game, which for me, I enjoy a lot more than uh, the, the physical asset grind of uh, the pieces of the game. Uh, next slide, please. So ways to work with us. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because if you're really interested, come see us. Truly passive investments, the way to go is, for, is through the fund. Right? Um, this is for credit investors only because it is through the SEC. The minimum buy-in here is 100 k Return is 8% plus, depending on how much you invest. It goes all the way from 8% to 20% return. But this is truly passive. You put your money in. You don't have to do anything. You send your report quarterly and you get distributions quarterly. Very straightforward. The other three ways that you can work with us are all around no education. Because for us, I think Larick hit on this, we're not going to set you up to fail. Right? There are a lot of things I've talked about in here. You've got to be educated on the game and the paperwork to be successful here. And so you cannot get access to inventory with us until you do some education. We're just, we're not going to set you up to fail. And so all of these programs are some version of us teaching you our proprietary due diligence process. We give you access to inventory. You're part of our community. We do different types of education every month. One of my favorites is scrape the tape. So if you're not feeling comfortable with due diligence, every Tuesday we all get on a live call. We go through the mortgage tapes together. We do diligence live on the call. You also get access to our exclusive events. And then um, again, the big one is access to inventory. Because once you're ready to go, everybody knows finding the deal is hard. And so we're going to bring inventory to you for you to go through. All right, this is a performing passive. That was in Little Rock, Arkansas, okay? And the ARV on this was 90,000. The unpaid balance, 58,000. And so the unpaid balance is effectively talking about how much money is left on the mortgage. And that's what we buy on. We don't buy on the assets value or ARV, we buy on the unpaid balance. And so in this particular note, every month you bought the note, you were bringing in $600, which is a combination of both your principal and interest every month. You can see what the insurance is, and we like to see a down payment from the buyers because make sure they got skin in the end, right? So you want performing notes, they're invested in keeping up with the mortgage payments on this property. We were able to purchase it at 90% of the unpaid balance, so we came into this note for only 53000 This was a passive investment strategy. It's a perfect pay, no late fees, 11 years left. Got it discounted. You can literally at this point send it to your servicer, get your check every month for $600, and keep going, right? This was 11% return on funds. It originated in 2020 and it tours in 2023, right? So if you're looking for passive performing notes, this is the type of notice what you're looking for. Well, let's take a quick look at a non-performing note, which is where I honestly get excited sometimes. Can you, uh, next slide, please? Because you'll see the power of non-performing notes if you're comfortable with some of the risks. So with the non-performing note, this is a property in Texas. It was a mortgage, so the as-is value of this property was 110k. The after repair value, we had done the work to take the market, was 160k. The reason why the numbers are a little bit different here is because if you buy into a non-performing note, you have to actually keep up that asset, right? While you're going through the process to take possession. So you have to pay the property taxes, you have to keep the insurance going, you're probably going to have an attorney. But the unpaid balance on this note was only $38,000. And we were all in with a discount on this note plus the insurance, plus the insurance fees for roughly $40,000, right? What was the strategy? Foreclosure and wholesale it, it's not performing. They were over five years delinqu delinquent. The property was completely vacant at that time. And so we began the foreclosure process. 
We had AK and HOA planes that had to be released, but acquired in 2019, sold in 2020 for 114K. We were all in for $40,000. So you can see the power, right, of these assets um, if you're willing to play the game. I'm not being rushed off yet. I got one more example. <laughs> Just walk you one more case study, and then I'm going to pass to my next speaker. So this one, I didn't actually have a picture of the house. This is my partner's deal. That's like, we're going to show you this. I'm going to show you an example of different types of paperwork. And so this was, is what's called a lease service option, where people might lease the property. You don't have to kind of paperwork, so it's not all just mortgages. But a lease service option, they're actually paying a lease property. And then a certain period of time, let's say five years, they get an option to And so on this particular property, uh, the tenant had paid the lease in two years. So they were behind. And the option to buy the property had expired. Right? We had to hold this for 13 months. Total expenses in was 63000 We made over uh, $111,000 on this. I say we each my partner. We combine it together. But what happened is once that lease service option expires, right, they had paid the lease in two years, the tenants actually wanted to get back up on the property they current, but they ended up having to put a new mortgage in and put on the property. So we, which is sometimes better than many, it's better paperwork. We put their name on the deed. And so, again, we do a lot to take care of our tenants. When they came back to that property, the new note was at the new price, not the lease price from five years ago when they bought it. And so again, coming into this $63,000 and making a profit of $111,000, uh, 111, that's a 171% profit on this type of paper. And so hopefully, I'm a, probably a little over, but you can see why I get really excited about bringing this asset class to you. Um, would love to talk a little bit more. Next slide's got my info on it. You can go one more, you can put my in touch. Um, so if you're interested in any information about the fund, email me, work at ebiotscapitalgroup.com. And then also if you're interested in the uh, mortgage notes, kind of education, you just want to build your own portfolio, you can go to learnaboutnotes.com. We are replatforming our online course that's going to launch again on June 10th, but there's a sign up there if you want to drop your name in and be uh, notified. And if you're interested in any of the hands-on training, etc., you can send me an email and we will set up time to talk. I hope that was helpful. Did you learn something? Show a hand. Show a hand. There was once a day that I would pray for you. I'd go and misbehave just so you'd notice too. Sneaking looks up and down from across the room. 